This is an awful experience I had some years ago. A friend set up a Pathfinder game in her house with four players. Most of us came straight from work and hungry, so before, we started ordering pizzas. Games started normally after eating most of them and went on for about one and a half hours. Shortly after that, one of the players bolts up and projectile vomits on the table. Right on the character sheets, dice, books, on some of us. Everything. With no warning. No complaint of feeling sick. Nothing. After the initial shock, he started apologizing profusely and tried to clean up the mess frantically. The host was pissed as hell, not the vomiter, but at the incident, and just told us to let her clean it up herself. We obliged and got her another book as an apology. We never had any issues like that, thankfully. Man, another story where there is not really a horrible bad guy. The only horrible bad guy here is just circumstances. The circumstance in this case being that someone ate too much pizza. Even though this is one of the worst things I've ever read, and definitely enough to ruin my day if it ever happened to me, I'm glad this group did not freak out the person who got sick. If anything, just because they're probably feeling a hell of a lot worse than everyone else in that room. Hello. First off, I must say I absolutely love your videos. Thanks, by the way. Second, the story. I like to join random open tables and have extremely bad luck about it, so I get a lot of stories about TTRPG fails, and I want to share the recent one. English is not my native language, but I hope I can describe everything correctly. It was a pay-to-play game, but a cheap one. When I come to such one-shots, I'm ready for random weird things, but this time, it was way worse than usual. We played Call of Cthulhu. The game master was clearly inexperienced, and I was ready to forgive him for some mistakes. The key word, though, is some. We played characters that were pre-generated by him, and he listed on character sheets all of the relationships and personal connections between characters, but we didn't have a scene introducing the characters, and I never found out the names of the other characters. Like, my character was a longtime friend with William, but I have no idea which person was playing William. If somebody wanted, for example, to help one of the other player's characters, they would just point at the player and say, I'm helping them, and almost everyone looked fine with it. Finally, we found the cure. With this, we may be able to save your family. You did good. Yeah, of course, um, dude? Dude? Um, hey man, come on. We've been adventuring together for years. Do you not know my name? I mean, you called me man. Do you know my name? God. I, I don't, I, I don't know your name. You're right. I, I, I don't even know my name? How? How is that possible? Hey, hey, hey! It's okay. Calm down, okay? We're both just characters made for sketch comedy. We're not supposed to have names or anything like that. Why would you say that? Dude, dude, pull back, alright? Well, what's wrong? You idiot! The minute the skit ends, we'll both cease to exist! But, but that's not possible. I, 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 have a, I have a family! You don't have a family! We were created just for sketch comedy! Wait, please, please, don't let this kid in! Please, don't let- When one of the players asks why we didn't have a scene where we could at least describe the appearance of our characters, the Game Master said that it is unnecessary, and by default, he assumes the characters look the same as the players. Right, I'm sure the 50-year-old widow in the 1930s looks like me, with my half-inch long blue hair. There was no roleplay, of course. Actually, I was mocked by some of the other players about roleplaying and not using meta information. There was also no minimum historical flavor, and the Game Master did not even describe decorations and locations. He just said, this is a hotel room. This is a college dorm. At the beginning of the game, he said that he paid a lot of attention to the atmosphere of the game. Sorry, man, but you hella didn't. And the Game Master just did not control the table. The characters, all the time, used information that they could not yet get from other characters. 80% of the spotlight time was on one or two characters, and the rest of us three, we were just there waiting. Sometimes up to an hour and a half in real time just to do small movements. Half of the characters were acting like a bunch of murder hobos, threatening NPCs with weapons just for fun, and it had no consequences. But when my character, the only woman in the party, spoke to the NPC for the first time during the game, it had consequences. This person was a lonely widower, and he started to flirt with my character, although she wasn't flirting and was rather unattractive. Because the Game Master decided that it would be funny. You know, why not add more laughs into Call of Cthulhu, a game about horror and tragedy. Why 
hair goes in such a good shape. Plenty of exercise and good diet. Uh, uh, get it? Get it? Is this, uh, is this landing with you? Oh, what about this one? I don't mind a few jokes, even in a dark game, but one of the players, the Game Master's friend, I think, and one of the spotlight stealers, literally inserted a reference to pop culture or to national criminal culture into every single sentence, and the Game Master was fine with it. But the last drop was when the player refused to follow the battle initiative because it's boring, and the Game Master just hand wave that too. Screw the initiative, screw counting the bullets we fire, let's just kick the monster's butt in call of Cthulhu. But on the other hand, on a meta level, it was a great horror game because it gave me the feeling that I was dying inside. A lot of it. Man, a Call of Cthulhu horror story, or as I like to call them, a cock <laughs> horror story. Surprisingly, we don't get a lot of these, but it's good to see it here because it does teach a lot of interesting lessons about Call of Cthulhu. Cock <laughs> is a game that requires a level of commitment to the horror of it. We talk about how hard it is to do horror in D&D, &D, and even though Call of Cthulhu does have more rules to cater to that environment, the roleplay elements of it still exist. You still need buy-in. And here, we see people not buying in. But most importantly, we see the dungeon master not buying in. Normally, with horror-type things, it's the players who are joking around and not taking it seriously that kind of ruin that environment. But if the DM isn't taking it seriously, well then... How the hell are you supposed to get a scary environment in that case? Mesh that with favoritism and the GM hand-waving a lot of really irritating behavior, and you have a game that is just not going to work out. Hopefully, though, you can find some good horror environment, especially during the spooky season. Half of my players left my campaign at the same time, and it feels like such a gut punch. I made my own homebrew world as my first campaign world, and after two groups that flaked out on me, I found a group to DM for, or so I thought. During my time as Dungeon Master, I noticed that I had a lot of long pauses, whether it be due to technical issues or me struggling to describe the situation, and I kept trying to nudge them into roleplay stuff. Stuff like, how do you react to this? And when I go silent and let them roleplay, they would just respond with dead silence unless I nudge them. It seemed like I had to drag the party through the plot because they wouldn't interact with the plot otherwise, and that's the kind of party I want to run with for obvious reasons. I'll admit I'm a very introverted person, so when it came to being a dungeon master, I had a lot of stage fright on top of other issues. We were playing session 3 when all of a sudden, three of the players left the server outright. One of them had given me advice after session 2, saying that I should follow in the footsteps of Lost Minds of Fendelver, but I don't want to run Lost Minds since I already have a world I spent hours making, and I already have a story I want to tell with that world and sticking with some module in a different world would suck. After they all quit, they sent me a DM saying that I need to run a module to slow down the pace and learn from D&D YouTubers and I need to prepare more. I barely have enough time to do the preparation I do thanks to work. So I told them how disheartening that was to me. They said, and I quote, I understand that, but I really hope you're taking the advice to heart. Being a game master is a lot more than just showing up and playing. Except I already knew that from the beginning. I wasn't even given a chance to become a good dungeon master. When that happened, I just wanted to cry, like, I already spent so much time trying to be the best of my ability to make a good session, but apparently, I'm not good enough, even though I'm a new dungeon master. I don't even know how to prepare for each session because I don't know how fast the players are going to go through said sessions. I don't want to DM for a long time after this because of how demotivated I feel, and I really, really hate r slash LFG with a passion now because the people there always flake on me last minute, and that's even if I can find people in the first place. I feel like it's probably best if I take a one month break from DMing just because of how much this hurt. It really took the wind out of my sails. I'll never get this campaign off the ground, will I? Well, if you have that attitude, you definitely won't. I do understand players that don't want to stick around for the Game Master to learn. We're all just trying to have fun here, and not everyone is going to enjoy helping a Game Master through their first ever experience. And not every Game Master is going to enjoy helping new players through their first time ever experience. Whenever I join groups outside my immediate friend group, I just don't get the same feeling, I'm gonna be honest with you. My best advice for new game masters is to start with groups that you are familiar with, if that is at all possible. It's my biggest piece of advice because your friends are going to be much more understanding. Random people don't know you, and they have no obligation to stick with you if they don't enjoy the campaign. In fact, they shouldn't have any obligation. They have their own lives too. There's not really a bad guy here, it's just, it's just life. The game's the game, you know? I do think you're gonna get this campaign off the ground. It might take a little bit, but I think you can do it. You just need to find people who are willing and wanting to play in the world and game that you created. Never written one of these before, but here we go. 
Crispy, my guy. I've been a big fan of your channel for a while. And with that, I feel like you're going to find that this story is, at the very least, a mildly refreshing middling horror story. Honestly, I'd go as far as to call it light horror, at least in my eyes. It's a nice blend of in-game and out-game problems, too. Thanks, by the way. This was, three or four years ago, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Let's start off with the fact that I cannot name any of the participants besides myself and the Dungeon Master. There were no concrete players, or at least, it didn't feel like there was. People joined the middle of sessions, people I'd never known were just in the game randomly, and I generally have no clue what was going on. I barely remember the three sessions I played of this game. I was playing a great old one, Pact of the Tome Warlock, whose patron was a jellyfish eldritch god who wanted to play games, and I liked this character a lot for the first two and a half sessions I played of him, but found that he was the catalyst of a minor issue. We'll get to that later. Let's start with my admittedly very minor issues with the game itself. The game master for this game was a player alongside me in a different game, and they were a generally experienced D&D player. However, they were a first-time game master, and on top of that, despite being a very creative person, they were a tad childish. We were high schoolers at the time, sophomore or junior year, in the tail end of the illness being a reason to be safe and sound in the house, and they notoriously engage with the game, even in its most serious moments, in a rather goofy manner. Wait, the DM did that? And um, I do mean sex, to be clear. <laughs> We've been waiting long. If you fancy a starian, you might want to consider therapy. Hey, don't judge me. Trying to do a thing here. I'm having a moment. Come on. I'm not saying this is a serious criticism. However, it does work against the concept they were trying to run. The world is a massive canopy of forest with man-eating insects, three times the size of people, dangerous flora and fauna, and very little safe passage between places. The sky was eternally dark from the thick brush miles above, and there was nowhere truly protected from the dangers of the world. The problem was, we encountered flowers that looked like lips that tried to literally kiss you. Man-eating beetles were never seen, only the docile ones who could ride like horses. It's probably just because I played in the first few sessions, but the serious, dangerous world tone of the campaign never really landed for me. The players, they were probably the biggest reason I ducked out of this game. Now, I didn't dislike the people. They were okay. What caused problems for me was that none of them really seemed like they wanted to engage with a semi-serious tone, and that fed into the DM's tendencies to take things in a goofy direction, which just destroyed the vibe at the best of times. On top of that, most of them were new D&D players, which meant they only had really the stereotypical view of their classes and characters. The rogue tried to hide every chance he got, even when it was unnecessary, like walking into the home of an ally. He and the paladin constantly got into lawful versus chaotic fights, and I could spend a good few sentences talking about that because it happened a fair few times. One character I will never forget, the player themselves, was playing a child with a zombie butler for a reason I never found out. Now this player was playing about the most annoying child character a child character can be, which is to say, petulant and generally a nuisance, stealing quest items we constantly had to try and get them back in order to work with the party, and they were more or less just derailing things just to derail things. I could talk about the sessions we played, I could talk about how we wandered into a dungeon in the first session to find an item that was lost, and how it culminated into being a lot of poison damage because people didn't want to focus at all and didn't pay much attention when the rogue did a dang good job hunting for the traps. I could talk about the second session where we were in the forest and encountered the kissy plants, and I had a good time for maybe 30 minutes before I wanted to get back on track and no one else did. And here's the thing, those don't matter. They really don't. Early D&D sessions with new groups are crunchy no matter what, when there isn't a session zero. There is always some grit, from no one knowing playstyle or how much goof is too much goof. Session three is where I quit, ultimately caused by in the middle of the session for no reason, most of the players deciding that they were going to go <laughs> eat people. No, I'm not exaggerating. The child character declared themselves as a cannibal and decided to go eat people. And everyone but me and the paladin agreed. And I simply said, I'm not having fun, and decided to bid the DM farewell, and told them I'd see them at the next session of the other game, and then I never came back to this one. Now for the unfortunate out-of-game horror, which was happening parallel to this game, which combined with me not enjoying the game too much, culminated in me leaving altogether. Bit of context. I'm black, I struggle with a wee bit of internalized racism in my youth as I lived in the mid and then deep south before moving back to the mid-south. In high school, I reached enlightenment and was born again without suffering. Uh, basically, I finally learned that I wasn't ugly. Good on you, dude. And started to appreciate my natural features more. More specifically, my hair. 
I don't play many extremely human characters in D&D. I like monsters a lot, and until that point, my characters were a four-eyed dragonborn, an orc barbarian who hid his entire body from head to toe, a furball inventor from the ilk of Caduceus Clay, and a hairless cat cowboy with a dozen stories that were all lies. In the end, here, I played Yanti Pureblood, which I used as an opportunity to make a D&D character that was, well, black. I wasn't nearly as good an artist then as I am now, but I drew him anyway, and I did it up. I love the way I drew his hair. Two strand twists, probably the most practical hairstyle for a black adventure because it takes no time to do, if you have enough hair, and won't get things caught in it, and still looks nice. The problem came when another artist in the channel decided to comment on that art, referring to it as curly noodle hair. This person wasn't even in the game, and was probably the main reason I dropped. See that alone. Look, whatever. People say things, they don't understand the connotations. Again, whatever. I corrected them, I asked them not to call it that, and then they just did it again. I asked once again, explaining that I asked initially because that's kind of inherently microaggressive. It's a protective style for black hair, and black hair is frequently mocked for looking like or being styled in a particular way. What happened for, I want to say the next 10 to 20 minutes, was me reiterating that same point while they just continuously got mad at me and had a breakdown saying they weren't racist and it was just hair. And you know what? Maybe it was, but this was important to me. My hair was a core issue for me for a long time, and someone mocking the same hairstyle I had at that same moment was admittedly just a little triggering for me. Someone else asked for a picture and said it looked nice, which did make me smile. It was the rogue in the game the story is about, and to be honest, I wouldn't mind playing with that rogue again sometime. Generally, they were a great person, and they could have taught me more about D&D. But the other artist doubled down and just continued to call it curly noodle hair. As I stood up for myself, I received, I want to say, four different messages telling me to drop it because it's not that big of a deal and the person making fun had severe trauma. Here's my problem, and it remains my problem with this experience to this day. How is that my fault or my problem? I explained this same thing to them, and without receiving the answer to that question, I was simply told that they'd gone through so much stuff and they didn't need to deal with me screaming racism at them for a comment when I once again pressed the issue of how me correcting them on doing something that upset me made it my fault that they had trauma. I was ridiculed for not dropping this. And after all that, and a couple other mishaps I remember that weren't nearly as egregious, one of which was that same artist telling me that I should never charge for my work and only do trades because it wasn't good enough to be worth money? Oh, damn. Oh, I would never. <laughs> oh. I still went back for that third session where I had that moment of clarity, realized it wasn't worth it, and I should just leave. And so I did. It was definitely for the best, that group seems to be more jokey and that's okay, that's their style, but you don't need to stick around for it. Session 0 might curb this, but it's good you at least tried it out for a couple sessions. There's nothing wrong with walking away from a game, especially one that seems to have a solid group going. If you walk away, it's not going to end the group forever, and you're free to find something that fits you better. But seriously, holy crap, that other random artist saying the things that they were saying, not okay. Look, there is a recording of a Scribio game me and my friends played, and the jokes we made in that game will never see the light of day. But that's just me and my friends screwing around together. This is a random guy telling another random guy that his art is not good enough to be worth money, that his hair looks like curly noodles. I mean, come on. You can't say that kind of thing and then expect to be liked. I find so often that people that say stupid things and do stupid things are always shocked when people don't like them for it. Well, guess what? If you want to be liked, be like a bull. Sometimes the best thing you could do is just close your mouth and stop saying the things you're saying, but this guy decided to double down, not once, but multiple times. Seriously, there are just some people in this world that need to learn how to shut up. I've actually been in a similar situation before a DD and d game, and I didn't stand up for myself, so big respect to you for taking a different path. This isn't my story, but my fiance's. I'll refer to him as Rory. Rory is a great dungeon master. He's enjoyed doing so for over 10 years. He plays exclusively with his and our friend groups. One time he decided to break that rule and invite someone from a Discord server to join he and his friends for a new campaign, as this friend was a friend of a friend who Rory had never met, but expressed tons of enthusiasm and interest in Dungeons and Dragons. Given everyone's work schedules and us being spread out over two counties, they opted for online Dungeon Dragons. 
voice chat, virtual maps, the whole deal. So the story began. I was making us food in the next room when my fiance finished their first session. He comes in and lets out a huge sigh and explains to me that while the new guy is very nice, he has a couple of traits that make playing with him a bit of a nightmare. For one, he is a huge stickler for exact rules. Rory and his friend group adore homebrew elements and adding their own magic items, etc. This new guy is not a fan of such things and he lets them know every time it's brought up. The second trait Rory was hesitant to mention. I finally got out of him that this new player has a very intense and prominent stutter. It affects every sentence the guy says and the guy says a lot. I admonished him and told him he can't discriminate against a willing player just because he has a speech impediment. Rory assured me that he wasn't, it was just a huge shock, and it took easily three times as long to proceed with things in game, and he just have to get used to it. Cue to about two months later, the campaign is over. They're doing an online planning session to see what the interest is for another one. My fiance suddenly comes out of our room, obviously furious. Get this, y'all. The stutter was fake. New guy decided that his character should have a stutter, and he likes to talk in character during all sessions. And I'll mention again, he made the stutter prominent and frequently talked over people to talk more. An example would be, oh, we should check out that inn, which then turns into, G -g 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 guys, we, we, we should, should, should check, should check out th 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 this inn. Not only that, but he would seemingly get embarrassed of his stutter if anyone tried to move things along, finish the obvious sentence he was working on, etc. And the group would try to be kind and encourage him, and he would hesitantly start over while everyone was sitting there waiting for him to finish his sentence. I don't know why, but this awkward acting thing over Discord makes me think of whenever I'm trying to avoid turning on my camera during a Zoom meeting and pretending to struggle to fix it. Crispy to fur. Oh, what? What's up? Chris Bitefer, your camera needs to be on, okay? It's been off this entire time. This 30-minute meeting filled with information that could have been gone over in a five-sentence email is very important. Oh, yeah, I am so sorry. I'm still I'm still trying to get it fixed. There's there's just something wrong with the camera. Like I I'm really trying my best. It's it's just as frustrating for me as it is for you. Are you trying to fix it? Oh, oh um, you know, like there's just I'm really trying it's some kind of I think it's some kind of internal glitch. I, I'm trying to figure it out, okay? But but, but trust me, I, I'm paying very close attention. I'm paying very close attention. In a funny way, it's kind of the opposite. I'm doing that to avoid attention. He's doing it to get it. Hmm. He has zero speech impediment in real life. He's just a hell of an attention seeker. He was not included in further campaigns at all. I gotta say though, what an effective troll he was. Hey, kudos to you and your fiancé for being accepting of someone with a speech impediment, even if it was super fake. This is behavior that we've actually never seen before. We've seen people who are attention-seeking and who want to get the spotlight in the game, but I've never seen somebody who goes out of their way to get that spotlight in this sort of manner. This technique is very domineering, to say the least. This person is trying to take over the conversation by being loud and using the speech impediment as an excuse to push back against criticism when people, you know, you know, express they don't like that. I don't need to explain that this sucks. It's not cool to do something like this, and eventually it is gonna come out. You can't hold that kind of thing for forever. I mean, I can fake my camera being broken for a little bit, but after a few weeks, people are gonna catch on, you know what I mean? Fortunately for Rory though, that web of lies collapsed in really quickly. I hope he never had to deal with anything like that ever again. Alright, and that's going to be it for today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Tabletop Tavern Tip series. We just did another Baller's Gate video, the last one for a little bit. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment. Can you just stop to let me know you made it to the end of the video? Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email in the description down below. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.